We're moving to chapter 19. And the very first thing we're going to cover, just like we did previously, if you remember when we first learned about kinematics, the first thing that we learned was linear kinematics, then we learned angular kinematics, which was rotation, and then we said, oh, they're related, right? Same thing we're going to do here. Uh, we're also going to learn about a new diagram called the body momentum diagram. Now, this is very similar to the other diagrams we're used to. It's just dealing with momentum instead of kin you know, kinetics. The kinetic diagram is the other one that looks just like it. So let's just do a little summary of what we've learned so far. And I'm going to throw in a few new um, subscripts. So we've got linear momentum. This is the first new one I'm throwing in, an L, standing for linear momentum. Okay, So L stands for linear momentum. It doesn't have to be a funny L. It can just be a regular L. <laughs> and that's equal to what? What is linear momentum? MV, right. You're thinking of angular momentum is R cross MV, but linear momentum is just MV. But in chapter 19, we are now dealing with rigid bodies. We are no longer dealing with particles. So when we say V, what do we mean? The V of what? What part of the object? The center of mass. Very good. So we're adding a subscript where the linear momentum is going to be the velocity of the center of mass as a vector. And this one is linear momentum. Then angular momentum. Uh, it's just a, this is what we're talking about. Here, are you happier now? OK. <laughs> All right. That's what I'm here for. OK, so the angular momentum, we already used h. A lot of times we did h naught. The naught was just saying it has to be about a point. The point that I'm going to pay attention to right now is the momentum the angular momentum about the center of mass. The angular momentum about the center of mass is equal to what? Well, I guess we don't really know that yet. Previously, we were making it r cross mv, right? But that was because we were dealing with particles. And particles were not rotating about their center of mass because they're so small, we don't care about their shape and size. Angular momentum is also equal to the moment of inertia about the center of mass times omega. If we are not about the center of mass, let's say we chose another point, any other point, we could say the angular momentum about that other point. I'm just going to choose P. We have an example and diagram here would be equal to the moment of inertia of P times omega. And how am I going to find that moment of inertia of point P? Parallel axis theorem, Ig plus Md squared. OK. Now, just like in our kinetic diagram, Another way to look at it is visually. We can say, if we want to sum up all of the angular momentums about any point, I'm going to first choose a positive direction. That's going to be what I consider my positive angular momentum. And I'm going to say the sum of all of the angular momentums about that point is going to be equal to, I can draw myself a new type of diagram. That diagram is called a body momentum diagram. It's exactly like our kinetic diagram. But instead of MAs, there are MVs. And instead of an IG alpha, it's an IG omega, OK? Because we're now dealing with omegas instead of alphas. And then we do the exact same thing. We find the moment of momentum. And we find the moment exactly like we know how to find moments. You pick the point, which is point P. And I put my right hand, so my thumb's pointing at point P. I'm going to treat this first force. I'm going to treat it like it's a force and say, well, that would be a negative times this perpendicular distance, right? So I do the line of con the um, line of action, the line of action of my velocity, 
and the perpendicular distance to that line of action. And then I say that's going to be equal to negative, because it bent my fingers backwards, y bar times m vgx. Next one would be plus x bar m vgy. And then we have to add on to it i g omega. Okay, so you can use this one or you can use this one. You don't have to use both. This one you have to use parallel axis theorem. And we're using the parallel axis theorem. That's where these x bars and y bars are coming from. Any questions about that? Okay. So this is kind of a summary slide because in reality, chapter 19 is not really adding anything new. No new concepts. We're just talking about a body that's spinning instead of a particle that's spinning. So let's look at translation, fixed rotation, and general planar motion. Let's talk about the linear and the angular momentum for each one of these situations. So the first one, we have pure translation. That means the whole body is just moving without spinning. What would my linear momentum be equal to? Very good. Uh, what would my angular momentum about the center of mass be equal to? Ig omega, good. And what's omega? Omega is zero because it's only translating. Uh, I did not put a harpoon on that on that equation. Anybody know why? Yeah, it's a scalar equation because of one thing, because we are in 2D. We are in 2D, so all of our omegas um, and all of our angular momentums all share the same direction. They share the k direction. If we were in 3D, it would have to be a vector equation. OK, how about the angular momentum about point A? What would that be equal to? Would it be zero? Remember that angular momentum is the moment of momentum. You wouldn't need to use a parallaxis theorem. You can actually just find the moment of that linear momentum that's shown. Okay. So if we have this linear momentum, mv, that's the line of action. This is the perpendicular distance from point A to that line of action. So it would be equal to d m, that's d, d m v g. And would it be positive or negative? I'm showing a positive. My thumb's at A, my fingers are pointing down towards D, and the force is coming in to curl them. Curling is a good thing, so it's positive. OK, any questions about that? So for a body only undergoing translation, it has linear momentum, but it also has angular momentum about every point in existence except for its center of mass. Any questions about that? OK. Rotation about a fixed axis. Now notice that I, I did something special with this rotation about a fixed axis. The fixed axis is not its center of mass. So would it have linear momentum? Yes, it would have linear momentum because its center of mass has a velocity. And it would be mvg. And then we'd have to realize that vg is going to be equal to rg omega. Okay. Does it have a moment of inertia about its center of mass, an angular moment of inertia about its center of mass? 
Yeah, it's rotating. It would be IG omega. How about the moment of inertia about O, which is the point it's rotating about? Well, we have two options there. We can either do an I O omega, or we can do a moment of moment of momentum. And we could draw our mom momentum equation where we would have mvgx, mvgy, and ig omega. And we could take the moment of that. We'd have to take that rg and turn it into its two components, one going this way, which would be our y bar, and one going this way, which would be our x bar. And we would say uh, H0 equals negative Y bar M VGX plus X bar M VGY plus IG omega. Okay, so we can use all of those equations. We can just pick the one that is most useful to solve that particular problem. And finally, with general planar motion, we of course have all of those. We have uh, angular momentum, our linear momentum, angular momentum about its center of mass, and we also have um, angular momentum about any other point, which is just the moment of momentum. What they're showing us here is in this particular case, it would be mvg times d plus ig omega. I kind of want to point out that there's two ways to do this part of it. Just like when we first learned moments. I don't know if you remember, when we first learned moments in statics, I gave you a vector, and I said you can either break the vector into two components and find the moment of each and add them, or you can just find the perpendicular distance to the line of action. That's the same thing here, right? The book chose to find that perpendicular distance to the line of action, and you can see that D is here. And if you put your thumb at A and point your fingers, it would end up being positive D times MVG. And that's where this came from. It came from using it the kinet or the momentum diagram. You could also separate that into its two components, X and Y, and solve it that way. And that'd be fine too. Any questions about any of that? OK, so now we have some tools that we can use. The principle of impulse and momentum is basically just saying that we start off with an initial momentum, both linear and angular. OK, we got both of those things going on. And then we got some forces and some moments and some stuff happening. That's called our impulse. And then at the end, we have a final momentum. The book is suggesting that you can write these out as three separate diagrams just kind of to help you organize your equations. Okay? And then what you'd say is, well, I have my linear momentum. My linear momentum in 2D, I'm going to get two equations out of that. I'm going to get mvgx1 plus the sum of the integral t1, t2 of fx dt equals m vg x2. And then I do the same thing for y. <coughs> then I also have angular momentum. Angular momentum, I, G, omega 1, plus sum of the integral T1, T2, M, moment about G, DT, is equal to I, G, omega 2. All of these terms I would get from this diagram, all the terms in the center, I get from what 
What is actually, it, they're calling it an impulse diagram, but what does it look like? A free body diagram. It's basically a free body diagram. The only thing they've done is they've added a T component to the forces and the moments. So you draw a free body diagram, and then you either take the integral dt, or if it's a constant force, it's just t2 minus t1, or the change in t. So it's basically just a free body diagram. And then, of course, all of these are drawn in that diagram. Any questions about that? Oh, I see what you mean. No, that's just a weird F. It's just F sub X. Is this, this what you meant right here? Yeah. yeah, that's just a weird F, sorry. It's F with a subscript X. So the force is in the X direction. Anything else unreadable? You're like, yeah, all of it. Okay. The book makes a big deal about conservation of momentum, um, almost to a point where it seems like it's something different than linear impulse and momentum, and it's not. It's the same thing. It's just remembering that we get to choose a system. Yeah. Yeah. So do you remember? I mean, obviously you remember it. You were just doing homework. The homework that you were doing we would have a system, like a boy jumping onto a barge, or a car driving on a barge, or a game of chicken, right? We got to choose the system. And we said, within that system, linear or momentum is conserved, right? The way that we know momentum is conserved is write out the equation, the same two that I just had on the last slide, uh, mvgx1, and this would be the sum plus the sum of T1 to T2, Fx dt is going to be equal to mvgx2. And I'm going to add a sum to that, too. Um, if we choose to use the, the momentum equation in a system, if we choose a system that includes all of the particles that are interacting, Anything that is internal to the system or is a non-impulsive force goes away. You remember that talk we had initially? So we only put Fs in here that are impulsive and external to our system. If they are not impulsive and external to our system, then we have no Fs. And now we have the conservation of momentum equation. Not two different equations. It's just is there external forces or not. Does that make sense? Of course, we have the same for y. It ends up being just the sum. And I'm just going to be really explicit the way I write it for, for just one time, and then I'll go back to the shortcut. The sum i equals 1 to n of m sub i v g x sub i 1 equals the sum i equals 1 to n of m sub i v g x sub i 2, and we do the same thing for y. Okay, and basically all that's saying is we can have a system and if we add up the, all of the linear momentums, initial, they have to equal all the linear momentums final, as long as we have no impulsive forces that are acting externally. Very similarly with angular momentum, we have I G omega 1 plus the sum of the integral from T1 to T2 of M G dt equals I G omega 2. We can put a sum on these as well. And we can say, well, if we have a system of particles and there are no external moments that are impulsive, right? There's no nothing that is making a big spinning motion to our entire system. Then this goes away. 
and we end up with the conservation of angular momentum, which just says the sum from I, I equals 1 to N of I G sub I omega uh, I 1 equals the sum I equals 1 to N of I G sub I omega I 2. So we can sum up all of their angular momentums of all of our particles, and they'd be equal before and after. Any questions about any of that? Okay. Okay, so the procedure that we're going to use to solve problems, very similar to our other procedures, we first set up our initial frame of reference, our inertial frame of reference, which just means a global coordinate system. We got to make our x, y's, and z's in a direction that is that makes sense for the problem. Then it's suggesting that we draw the impulse momentum diagrams for the body. That was this slide. No, nope, not that one. This slide. These are the impulse momentum diagrams. It's basically just a way to sum up what's happening before and after an impulse, and also what the impulse is. Okay. Can be very useful in some problems. Then we compute any moment of inertia that we're going to need. We apply the equation of impulse and momentum. Now this it says one scalar and one vector. Basically, that's specific to 3D, right? Oh, I'm sorry, that's specific to 2D. One vector would be the x and y direction, and then the scalar one would be uh, angular momentum, but only if we're in 2D. If we're in 3D, there's going to be three uh, angular momentum equations yet for a total of six. If more than three equations are involved, kinematic equations relating velocity, mass center, and angular velocity should be used. This is the same as what we did before. This is just using kinematics to solve the problem. Okay, any questions about any of that? Okay, so we're going to work through this problem now. And uh, I am using a very simple problem to, to demonstrate a process. So we're basically going to do the diagrams on this problem so you can see how the diagrams can be used in future problems. Uh, so the problem states, a 300 kilogram wheel has a radius of gyration of its mass center of K naught equals 0 0.4. So I'm going to write my givens. Mass equals 300 kilograms. Thanks. Uh, and we've got a radius of gyration about O is 0 0.4 meters. The wheel is subjected to a couple moment of 300 newton meters. So the moment equals 300 newton meters. Find the angular velocity after six seconds. Supposed to find uh, omega at six seconds. If it starts from rest and no slipping occurs. So they're giving you a few hints on this one. OK, so now what we're going to do is we're going to draw basically our diagrams of the momentum before, the impulse, and the momentum after. And we're going to use that to write equations. So momentum before, even though we know it's not moving, I'm still going to draw the way it would be moving if it, if it were. So I'm going to draw that body, and then I draw the center of mass. And I'm going to draw m v g 1. Right, that's that linear momentum. I also have to add i g omega. This is where you get to make a choice on whether you want to include your negative sign with your omega or not. Okay. Which way is this wheel actually going to roll? Like what would omega be clockwise or counterclockwise? Clockwise. Clockwise is typically a negative moment, right? So the way I like to do things is just keep it all positive, and then when I solve for omega, expect a negative. Okay? So that means I would actually do this. And I would say that's equal to Ig omega. And that's omega 1. Okay, Then I have to draw my impulse diagram, which is just a free body diagram. So we're just going to draw a free body diagram. 
Okay, when I draw the moment on this one, I'm going to draw it in the direction it's acting. I'm not going to draw it only in the positive direction, just like I didn't draw the W in the positive direction. Okay. Okay, I'm missing friction. Let's. We had a great debate in the first class about which direction friction's moving. So let's let's see if there's a debate in this one too. Which way is friction? To the right or to the left? To the right. Okay, I heard some to the right. Do I have any votes for to the left? Okay, good. So you're saying that these little particles on the wheel are trying to force themselves to slip, right? If you look at that moment, just this is like your car tire. Your car tire has an axle going to it, and that axle is applying a moment to your car tire. If you were on ice, that moment would just cause the tire to spin. And it would just spin and it would sit there. But friction is keeping it from spinning. So these particles here are trying to move this way, and friction says, uh uh, you gotta go that way. Okay, so it's to the right. Good. It was much more of a debate in the first class, which I thought was interesting. Okay, so that plus this is gonna be equal to my second. And I'm gonna make this one look exactly the same as the first one. M VG2 and IG omega 2. So those three diagrams can really help you pull out linear and angular momentum. In this particular case, it's probably easier to just go with angular momentum. But what do we want to take angular momentum about? Which point would we want to take angular momentum about? Okay, we could do it about O, but friction's going to be in my equation if I do that. And I don't like that because I don't want to deal with it, right? I want to make my life as easy as possible. So A, A is a good choice because friction and normal force are both acting at A, and they won't be part of my equation for a moment. So if I pick A on all three of these, I'm just going to go through and find the moment of momentum on all three of them. The first one is just going to be a negative m v g1 times the radius. I'll just put r plus i g omega 1. Of course, that was all kind of a waste of time because what's omega 1? Zero. And what's vg1? Zero. Okay, so everything's zero to start off with, but it kind of helps as an exercise. Now we're going to do the exact same thing here. This is where it pays that we chose a because we need to find this, the moments about point A. And W, F, and N all pass right through A. So all of those aren't causing a moment. So I'm just left with the integral of the moment dt from t1 to t2. However, it's very important that I pay attention to sign. Just like if I was doing some of the forces, I would put, if I did some of the forces in the y direction, W would be negative. Right? Look at my M. Is it positive or negative? Negative. And that's going to be equal to, same thing here, negative M V G2 times R plus I G omega 2. Okay, now we just plug in the values that we're given. We have the integral from 0 to 6 of negative 300 newton meters dt equals negative 300 kilograms times vg2 times 0 0.6 meters plus uh, m k naught squared omega 2. Okay, so the next step is I just perform that integration. Negative 1800 newton meter seconds is equal to uh, negative 180 times VG2 plus 300 times 0 0.4 squared omega. We've gotten somewhere. Now what? I have one equation and two unknowns. 
Are those two unknowns related in any way? Good. So we're going to use kinematics now, right? And with kinematics, we know that the velocity is going to be omega r. But we have to pay attention to signs. So if I, if I look at my momentum diagram, if I have a positive omega, which way would this thing be rolling? It would be rolling to the left, which means this direction is the opposite of my positive x direction. Right, this is my positive xy. If I have a positive omega, I get a negative v. So I have to use the equation vg2 equals negative omega r. It's very important to check that. Now, I could have put my omega in the other direction, and then I, it wouldn't have been a negative. And we would have got the same answer, and it would have worked. It's all just about record keeping. You have to choose which way you're doing and mentally make that choice and stick with it. Good. So now we have one equation, one unknown. We can solve for it, omega 2 is equal to negative 11.5 radians per second. What does the negative mean? It means it's rolling to the right. So we could also write that as omega 2 is equal to 11.5 radians per second in this direction. 